Hello, physics students. Welcome to our next and final topic of our course called Modern Physics. Now, before I begin with the topic for today, I just want to make some comments. The first is the term modern. Modern physics, if you look at the unit plan that I put in our Google stream, I put the word modern in quotes. And the reason why is because this stuff that we're going to be learning in this topic, much of it was discovered in the early 1900s. In fact, today's information was first proposed by Albert Einstein in 1905. But the reason we call it modern physics is because it ushered in a new era in physics. Basically, the Newtonian world of the universe was demolished by physicists and replaced with a new idea of how the universe works. Very exciting stuff, and we're really going to expand on that tomorrow. But today, I just want to go into the first, one of the very first uh, sort of discoveries humans made about this modern physics, and it pertains to light. So that's where we begin today. We're going to reconceptualize how we think of light. Now, I have a light bulb here, and what I could do is just plug it directly into an outlet over here, and you'll see it's going to be very bright. So there is uh, the light bulb on, and, and this light bulb only has the ability to be turned on and off at one intensity. But what I'm going to use is this device, and it's going to help me vary that intensity. This will go into the outlet instead, and then the light will be plugged into this outlet on this device. And then, let me bring this closer, you can see that there's a dial on here that's currently at zero. Uh, let's see, yeah, zero. And I could turn that dial to read up to 135, but I'll settle it right here, which is approximately 115 volts, which is the approximate voltage of the wall outlet. So I'll be able to gradually turn the light bulb up instead of just on and off. Now, before I retreat away, you might be looking at this and saying, it looks kind of old, and this is really cool. I love this. So I pulled this out of the storeroom and I cleaned it up. It was all black and dirty and I scrubbed it down and I found a date, November 4th, 1954. That's how old this device is. So I love it. It's really cool. I like old stuff like this. Just to give you an indication of how old that is, if I could just sort of go on a little tangent for a moment, please excuse the tangent. So this is older then the building I'm in. Our high school was built 20 years, approximately 20 years after someone wrote that date on here. So I don't know what high school this device began at, but not this one had a life before. And also whoever brought it here, probably, well, most certainly not alive anymore. And also this was in existence way before we landed on the moon. And uh, if you want to get a sense, basically at that time, we were right in the nuclear arms race and the Cold War just began. So pretty scary time. But this thing has seen a lot of history. And it's going to see a little bit more history. It's going to help us with our concept today. So I plug the device in. I'll plug the light bulb in. And, and now I'll turn this on. Nothing happens because it's at zero volts and so the light bulb is, gets no, no voltage. But if I turn it to, let's see, right around 30 volts, you see it started to glow, and then I could go 35, 40, and I could turn it up to the wall outlet, so there's the original brightness. But any brightness I want, and I can achieve it by turning this dial right here. And so that creates an illusion. We tend to think of this light as being able to be turned to any intensity, a continuous increasing, a gradual increase, whatever brightness I want, I could make this one billionth as bright, one trillionth as bright, turn it down ever so slightly. But as I said, that's an illusion that light is a continuously variable uh, quantity that can be increased smoothly and gradually and continuously. So what is the true picture of light? that Albert Einstein discovered in 1905. Let me change the view of the camera so we could go to the board and have a look. 
Now the idea that the brightness or the intensity of light can be varied from zero up to any value we want smoothly and continuously follows from viewing light as a wave. And why did humans think light was a wave? Well, because light can and does what all waves do. It can, for example, interfere. A little bit of light can meet another bit of light and you can have constructive or destructive interference. In other words, the two lights can reinforce each other and create more intensity, more brightness, or they can cancel each other out and create zero intensity or zero brightness. Light can also reflect like all waves. Light can and does diffract. Remember, when a wave passes through a tiny opening, it spreads out and fills the region it's going into if the opening is small. Light can do that and does that all the time. And light can also refract or bend when it goes through different media. In other words, another wave property. But Albert Einstein, Einstein discovered in 1905 that yes, light can and does all those things. But on a sub-microscopic level, light is emitted in fixed bundles, fixed packets of energy, and it's absorbed in fixed bundles or fixed packets of energy. Those packets he called photons. And that's the topic for today. Modern Physics 1, photons. So imagine I have a light source here, like a light bulb. See, I've drawn this right here. And rather than thinking of it as having crests and troughs, we imagine it now as being a collection of tiny bullets little particles. So you think of this as kind of like a machine gun sending out bullets, bullet after bullet continuously in all directions. Now I draw photons like this because yes they're packets of energy but they're also waves at the same time. What a photon really is is very complicated. You could study it for decades and still be surprised by what photons do. It's its own thing but what we're using is the idea the analogy that it's like a little bullet to help us revise our understanding of what it is. It's not a pure wave. It's like on that tiny, tiny level, a little bullet. And so here we are, photon is like a tiny bullet in quotes of light. In other words, it's viewed as a particle. So now all particles flying, think of bullets, they have momentum and energy. For example, if I block a wood here and I shoot a little BB gun, into it. That little BB has a little momentum and gets the block moving. If I shoot a high-powered rifle, you know, and then the block takes off because of the more momentum of the bullet. Shoot a cannonball even more, right? So momentum and energy. So what are the momentum and energy of a photon? Well, P for momentum is some constant H, I'll talk about in a second, it's called Planck's constant over the wavelength of light, or if you have the frequency, you could use HF over the speed, this C. Again, C is a special symbol, the speed of light in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eighth. The energy of a photon of light, of these little bullets, is HF, E for energy, HF, that same constant, or if you have the wavelength, HC over lambda, and here's that constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. Now, of course, this is on the reference table. You don't have to memorize any of this. So right here is our section of the reference table where we were working in the last topic, the wave section. Below that, we have the modern physics section. And you see the energy of a photon right here, HF equals HC over lambda. The momentum of a photon is not part of the curriculum. I just put on the board just to be complete for today. Now, Planck's constant, so those are the equations. Planck's constant, front cover of the reference table. If you go most of the way down in that first table right here, uh, where is it, Planck's constant, H, and you see on the side there, 6.63 times 10 to minus 34 and the unit joule second. Of course, the speed of light is also there. We learned about that in the wave section. So speed of light in a vacuum, third one down here. I'm stuck here. Speed of light in a vacuum, and you see C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meter second. So you find this stuff on the reference table. 
All right, so let's move on to our first example. So, oh, let me create a pause to give you a chance to copy these notes down. Moving on. So, determine the energy of a photon of green light. I, I forgot some words, so I just tucked them in rather than write all the notes over. With the frequency of 6 times 10 to 14 hertz in joules and in electron volts. Now, first thing. Why is that green light? Well, remember in the optic section or in the wave section, we learned about the electromagnetic spectrum and you could look up that any light that's vibrating at a frequency between 6.1 and 5.2 times 10 to the 14th, which this is, when that light goes in your eyes, you would perceive that as green. So that could be like the light coming off this reference table, for example. So the first thing, the energy in joules. So we go to the reference table, we find this formula, we write it down. Remember, Regents, you have to show three steps in all calculations or you're going to lose points. So I write the formula. Now, normally I write the formula on the second line. I chose to go over here on the side. Perfectly fine. So I write out Planck's constant, 6.63, 10 to minus 34. Don't forget the units of joule seconds. The frequency, don't forget the units. Punch it on the calculator, 3.98 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Now, I want to just talk about that for a little bit because 10 to the minus 19th is tiny. That means I put a dot, 18, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 398. So imagine that point zero zero zero, that tiny, tiny number. That's the energy of this photon. That's the energy of the, the bullets coming out of a green colored light bulb. And this explains why humans did not know that photons existed for centuries or millennia or thousands of years because the energy of these little bullets is tiny. When you turn a light bulb on and you put it next to your forehead, okay, like this, so it's the light's hitting my forehead, I don't feel bullets hitting my head like this. I don't feel that. That's what it would feel like if the bullets were very big. But the bullets are a tiny bit of energy. So let me give you an idea of how many photons it takes to perceive or feel the amount of energy in that collection of photons. Imagine you're going to the polar bear club where people cut holes in the ice and you jump in the water. Everybody knows that. Oh, that's freezing. How do those people do that, right? So you jump in the water, and let's suppose the water is a little bit above freezing. 32 is freezing, so let's say it's 35 degrees Fahrenheit. If you jump into 35 degree Fahrenheit water, or if you jump into 36 degree Fahrenheit water, do you think if you jump into the 36, you say, ooh, this is warmer, this is nice. No, you're freezing either way. 35, 36, that's not much difference. You can't even feel the difference between 35 degrees Fahrenheit and 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So imagine I take some icy water and I put it in my hand like this and I've got a little bit of water here, right? You see that water that dripped out? So that, I had that much water in my hand and I, it's, it's 35 degrees Fahrenheit, one cubic cc of water. And I shine not even a trillion photons, not even trillion, uh, multiple trillions. In fact, if I shine a trillion photons, it's still not enough to raise the water one degree Fahrenheit. I would have to shine a trillion, shine another trillion, shine another trillion, and do that five million times. And five million times a trillion, that many photons, green light hitting that drop of water in my hand and the drop of water goes from 35 to 36 degrees. That's how many photons it takes to not even feel the difference. So whenever you're absorbing photons with your own body, you don't feel smack, 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 smack of the little bullets because they're so tiny. What happens is you feel zillions of photons, there's not even a word for it, and they all hit you, boom, 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 boom. And what do you feel? a oh, nice gentle glow of warmth. So that's why humans never noticed this. It took Albert Einstein to notice it. And I'll talk about how he figured that out in a moment. Albert Einstein, genius, right? Everybody knows. Now, this is, again, a tiny amount of energy. And to report it in joules 
is obnoxious. Let me show you an example why it's obnoxious. So let's suppose you're doing something, your parents are on the computer because they want to buy a new couch and they're looking at couches online. And they say to you, hey, go, go to the living room and measure us the couch length so we could look up the right couch that we want. So, oh man, now they're asking me to do something again. So you go to the, the living room, you measure, and it's 68 inches, six and a half, or 78 inches, six and a half feet, and you want to get back at your parents. So you say, all right, I got the length of the couch. It's 1.2 times 10 to the minus three miles. And you're correct. It's really that many miles. But your parents say, Miles, what, what's the matter with you? Stop being obnoxious. Tell us in like inches or something like that, right? So they want you to measure the couch in a smaller unit, something that makes sense, not a mile, which is huge. Well, a joule, as I just explained, is even bigger to the photon than a mile is to your couch. So physicists, they invent a new amount of energy instead of joule to deal with photons. And that is the electron volt, which we're going to calculate. But before I go and do the calculation, I just want to explain the theory behind an electron volt. So let me make some room here. So let's forget about electron volts and let's just think about joules of energy. Let's suppose you've got a battery with a certain voltage and you want to make energy, which is work, with a certain amount of charge, which is in coulombs. So let's suppose you take a one volt battery and you allow one coulomb to pass through that battery. How much energy is that? You multiply this over, one times one gives you one, and then the units are coulomb volts, which we could say a coulomb volt is a joule, so it's one joule of energy for a coulomb of charge. Again, not convenient for our particular application today. So let's suppose instead, let's take that one volt battery, oops, that one volt battery, and Let's pull a certain amount of energy, but we're only going to allow one electron to pass through it. How much energy do we get? The energy is one times one, electron times volt, one electron volt. And so, an electron volt is literally this, the amount of energy you get out of a one volt battery if you let one single tiny electron pass from one terminal of the battery to the other. Tiny fragment, tiny bit of energy, because an electron is tiny through the one volt battery. Now, what's the conversion factor? I'll get to that in a minute. So how do we convert this to electron volts? What we do is something that you did, uh, I believe you did in chemistry class last year. Dimensional analysis is what they called it. You start with your original number. And then what you do is you multiply by a fraction. And make sure you put multiply. A lot of students put an equal here. You're not setting up a ratio. You're multiplying by a fraction. And what you want to do is you want joules to go away, so you put joules in the bottom. And you want electron volts to remain, so you put it in the top. Now we're going to have joules divided by joules, and we're going to be left with just the electron volt unit. But what are the numbers that go along with this? To figure out the numbers that go along with that, the, the units, what you do is you go to the front cover of the reference table and you look up what one electron volt is right here where my finger is. One electron volt. And then on this side you see it's equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. So there's the conversion. And again, one electron volt was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. The joules go away, leaving us electron volts. So what we're really doing is we're taking this 3.98, 10 to the minus 19, and we're dividing by that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So give me a moment, and I'll continue. I forgot I didn't create a pause. So let me create a pause to, get you, to give you an opportunity to copy these notes down. All right, punch that on the calculator, that divided by that. And what you get is 2.49 electron volts. See how much easier that is than saying that awkward? You just say 2.49. That's the energy in the electron volt energy. 
Now, before I move on, I wanna just uh, show you how you would convert if you had electron volts and you wanted to go back to joules. See, we had joules, we went to electron volts. What if you have this and you wanna go back to joules? It's basically the same kind of operation. You could say E equals 2.94 electron volts, multiply, not an equal sign, by a fraction. This time, we want EVs in the bottom and joules in the top, so the EVs go away, leaving us joules. What are the numbers that go along with those units? We go to our reference table, front cover, as, you know, I won't go to the screen again, but 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 joules to one electron volt. So now we're taking this 2.94, multiplying by that, and we get the original 3.98, 10 to the minus 19th uh, joules. That's the energy, okay? So that's the way to convert the other way. Let me create a pause to give you a chance to copy these notes down. Okay, so now the question is, why does this matter? Why does it matter that these light is actually made of these tiny bullets? There's a lot of reasons actually. So let me start with the historical. So the very first was the photoelectric effect. This is actually what led Albert Einstein to come up with this theory. There was one experiment. Physicists thought they pretty much understood everything about the universe, but there were a few little things they couldn't explain, and one of them was something called the photoelectric experiment. Shine light on metal and weird things were happening and nobody could explain it because they were thinking about light as a wave. Albert Einstein comes along and says, no, it's a tiny bullet, a tiny particle, which we call a photon. He wrote out all the formulas and he showed through the math that that explained why the weird things were happening and he won the Nobel Prize for that. But I'm not gonna go into the photoelectric effect because it's not really part of the curriculum and it's pretty complicated. Not complicated, just so much to it. I'd take like a whole video to explain it because there's so many things to it. Photoelectric effect, another thing, that I will explain is something called Compton scattering. So if light is truly like a particle, like a little bullet, that means it should interact with other particles the way particles interact. For example, if I have a, an electron floating here and I take another electron and I shoot it like this, they bounce off each other. They really don't even touch. They repel and then they go like this. Imagine you're playing billiards and you hit a cue ball and then the eight ball goes one direction, the cue ball goes the other. Basically like that. They're hitting like little particles. Does that happen with light? Absolutely. There are experiments where you could take a floating electron and shine light on it. And what happens is now that we know that light is photons, one of those photon bullets comes, pew, and these go off in different directions like this. So they kind of ricochet off from each other. So in the initial, we've got a photon. I'm trying to draw crests and troughs because it's both a wave and a particle. So this is, let's say, an X-ray, which is a photon of a very high frequency, very high energy. And we have an electron sitting here, just sort of hanging out there floating. This is coming in with V equals C, in other words, three times 10 to the eighth, extremely fast. Hits, and what happens after is the electron, here's the target point, you know, and the electron is now flying off like this with some V, eh, it's a little sloppy. And then the photon comes from this point, and what we find is that the wavelength has increased. So this still goes at three times 10 to the eighth. Now, when it comes to particles, when the cue ball hits the eight ball, it slows down, it loses a little kinetic energy. But photons can never slow down, no matter what the frequency is, no matter what the energy is, they're always traveling three times 10 to the eighth. So the way that it loses energy 
is either the frequency goes, or both, the frequency goes down and the wavelength increases. It's no longer an X-ray. So that's basically a photon. So I was running out of space there, but basically the photon loses energy and that means the wavelength increases, but the speed does not. It still stays three times 10 to the eighth. So let me create a pause to give you a chance to copy these notes down. Okay, and so you might be thinking, all right, this is kind of a boring video. Who cares? I'm never going to do an experiment with photoelectric effect. I'm never going to do a Compton scattering experiment. I don't need to know this in everyday life. Not true. This has some very serious consequences for people. Photons, the concept of a photon. Some of you may know somebody who died or have got sick of skin cancer, okay? That has everything to do with photons. Photons can literally mean life or death for people, for you, okay? So, why is that the case? So, all these photons, so actually maybe I'll jot this down. I guess it doesn't have to be skin cancer. It could be any kind of cancer. But basically, let's suppose in here right now, or if I go like this, like we did earlier, I illuminate my face and I'm getting hit with visible light. So these are all the light waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. All the colors are coming out of that light bulb so we see it as white. So all that has a certain energy to it. So I'm getting hit in the face with little bullets all with a certain amount of energy. But what's my face made of? My face is made of little bits of life too, cells. A cell can die and I live on, right? So you can lose cells and they're replaced. So it's like a whole nother, in a sense, like an ecosystem. So your skin cells are being hit by tiny bullets. The analogy of that light is like if you line me up against a wall like this and you say, that's it, I'm going to kill you, and you get out a little ping pong gun or nerf, nerf gun or something and you shoot me in the stomach, right? Poof, bounces off. Nothing. Not fatal, right? That little bullet has too little energy and it bounces off and it doesn't kill me. It doesn't penetrate into my body and cause damage. You could shoot me with a hundred ping pong balls a thousand, a million, a zillion, and they just keep bouncing off my stomach. And yet, if you come with one rifle, a real gun, shoot me with one single bullet, kills me, okay? And that's the analogy of skin cancer when you're out in the sun. Because sunlight is visible light, but it's other things too. Sunlight, also has ultraviolet rays in it. And if you look at our spectrum here, let's get the focus going. So you see visible light all here in this little band expanded out here, but it's all here. If you go up in frequency, you get to ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays. So these all have higher frequencies and therefore we see higher frequency, higher energy to the bullets. So UV light higher frequency than visible light higher energy and so the analogy is really like the rifle the real gun hitting me in the stomach penetrates my skin and damages the organs and then it could kill me well, that little bullet of UV light, you can't see it, you can't feel it, it's too small. It's still a tiny bit of energy for your big body, so you get hit with the UV light, you don't feel that. But it hits your cell, and it tunnels through your cell, and maybe it hits a DNA molecule in the nucleus of your cell. And that's a little bullet that poof, maims that DNA particle. And if it kills the DNA, you're probably okay, you wake up and you say, oh, my sunburn, oh, man, and you have to stay out of sun. And your body heals and fixes that damage. 
but if it doesn't quite kill the DNA, but sort of twists it up, it creates a mutant DNA, a mutant cell that starts replicating, 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 and unfortunately, that is the cancer that we, you know, you know about. So any kind of electromagnetic wave beyond the visible light, ultraviolet, sunlight, or tanning beds without sunscreen. Well, why would you go to a tanning bed with sunscreen? All right, but you get the idea. The sunscreen blocks that stuff, but those high frequency, high energy photons can cause DNA damage. Gamma rays, x-rays, whenever you go to get an x-ray, that's why people don't want you to get x-rays all the time. Only if you're hurt and you need it, you know, because there are other problems that could cause damage. But technically, you go in for an x-ray, it could cause cancer. That's why, I don't know, when you go to the dentist, they put the heavy blanket on you of lead to protect your body and only target the one part they need. So, you know, people try and be careful, but there's a risk to every single bit of electromagnetic radiation. It's like, I, I guess, to be morbid, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, game Russian Roulette, where you take a revolver, you put one bullet, you spin the chamber and you go like this, you know. Uh, sometimes you see the crazy behavior in a movie. But basically, it's in a sense like that. You spin that chamber, there's one bullet, click, maybe nothing happens. So you go out in the sun, you tan all day, and maybe no photon causes cancer. But there's a chance. Every time you're in the sun, it's like playing the game again. And so, of course, the odds are, you know, small, but they're there. And the more you're out, the more you're exposing yourself to that risk. All because of photons, every bit of light, electromagnetic radiation is actually little tiny bullets that can cause effects on your cells. So uh, let's try and uh, end on a more positive note uh, because now everyone's going to wear sunscreen. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. No one's going to want to get tan anymore. They're going to want to just be happy with whatever color they are. But anyway, light is made of these tiny bundles, photons. The energy, there's a formula for it. There's also a formula for the momentum. You're responsible for the calculation I erased to figure out the energy of such a photon in joules. The equation tells you energy in joules. And then to be able to convert back and forth to electron volts, look at those calculations. That's really primarily what's going to be on the tests and the regions. All right, so that was our first step into modern physics, light waves can be or are like particles on a tiny level. So I hope you enjoyed the physics. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you weren't too annoyed with the lecturing and preaching about the uh, UV light. I'll see you in the next physics video.